Oh, hello. Many Magic the Gathering players ask the question, how do I synergize and streamline my commander deck? This is a question that has to do with commander decks that already exist, already work, they're on curve, they've got the right mana base, but maybe just aren't getting there in terms of results, or maybe you're just unhappy with those results. So we're going to talk today, I have with me the famous or perhaps infamous. I'll take that one. <laughs> it seems better. <laughs> Olivia Gobert-Hicks, commander addict and member of the commander advisory group. I prefer evangelist. but sure. Evangelist, commander evangelist, <laughs> but you are an addict. Yeah, totally. Like, all she does is play commander. It's obscene, obscene. But we're going to use that obscenity for our own advantages today. What are we talking about when we say synergize and streamline a deck. I mentioned already, it's a deck that's working. So right, right off the bat, you already have your commander deck and it's working, but something's not right. What's not right? What's going on? Right, well, that's exactly it, is you can have a deck that you like, that you're happy with the build, the overall archetype or your number of win cons, all that makes sense, but something's lacking. You don't, you feel like every time you try to get the win, you're on the precipice. Like if I just had the right card, this would all work perfectly. Mm -hmm. I think it's about finding those things that when you were building and didn't even get the chance to like truly play test with the group looked good on paper. And then either you never draw the card or you have a different card that shows up in your hand and is dead and you can't use, or it just doesn't do what you need it to do or have the full value impact that you're hoping for once it does get played. It's finding those and saying, okay, this is the right starting point, but what's the card I need that's actually going to put this over the edge? I like to also describe this as a deck that maybe you just need more oomph. Because yeah. I feel that way where I sit down with a deck and maybe it's actually, again, on curve, but it just doesn't have enough relevance to the game that's going on. The cards don't seem to be having enough impact. And I just wish I could give it a little bit more gas, not yeah. super overdrive it, but ramp it up a little bit more. It's almost like optimizing it within the level that it's already at, not necessarily taking right. it to the next one or dropping it down, but being like, okay, this is still about the same power level, but it could be better. Fine tuning. Fine yeah, tuning. it's just very a little, fine tuning. It's, right. not, it's not necessarily raising or dropping a power level. It's just like, this would actually just be the better pairing of this of these two cards or of this you know mechanic whatever it may be it's just yeah it's, all right it's so cleaning it up fine tuning synergizing yeah. streamlining any of those you want to put in there what's the first step you're going to do you have your deck what is step one for me step one is play having played the deck oh, yes. if you <laughs> haven't mean, played your deck and you think something's part. wrong with your deck then <laughs> you there might be a larger issue I, and i'm not saying listen therapy doesn't work for everyone <laughs> maybe but not there, even but for deck maybe building maybe like you're just like my deck isn't working have you played it no <sighs> tell me about your mother you know <laughs> Like, cuz when I when I build I I am very much like I have an idea or I see this commander it's like I I just need to build something that's different. So I'll just go through the shoebox archives and find everything that's either in the right colors or says a certain word on sure. and just make a pile this big. Sure. Whittle that down, have a deck, play it first because then you'll have an idea of what your next step is, which is going through and being like every time I've seen this card, has it worked for me? Have I even seen this card come through in a game? If you have did it do what I wanted it to do? Was it sitting in my hand? Did it actually offer me any benefit? Is it something that would have been perfect, but the way my curve is, it's going to take me longer to cast it than when I actually need it to, you know, to go off or hit the battlefield and set those aside and start IDing. Okay, well, these are the cards that didn't work exactly how I'd hoped and go from there as far as now that I know what these are like, hey, this card that I've seen, I don't want to consider cutting it. It worked exactly as intended. It was on curve. It did what I needed with another card. It was really, uh, it synergized well with the commander. Like, don't worry about those. Just find the stuff that's not working, didn't work, you haven't seen. And if you haven't seen it and the deck's doing fine, maybe you don't actually need that. Those are the kind of ones that you want to set to the side and be like, okay, here's what I'm working from and here's what I need to improve on. So step one is go through your existing deck and identify mm -hmm. underperforming or non-performing or other, otherwise questionable cards. Yeah. And some of the things that we look for there might be 
whether or not it is having an impact. So if you've cast this card, I like to say, if this is a card you cast and it doesn't do anything for you in your game and you know this, you're like, I've resolved this card. It has come up. I have successfully mm -hmm. cast it. And then I pass the turn and I feel sad. <laughs> this is a card that you might remove. Now, during this step, I really want to stress you, what you take out maybe goes right back in. Yeah. So don't be afraid where I'm looking through my, my Sig River guide and maybe I think, do I really want to have a Master of Waves in here? I'm questioning my devotion to blue. Is that really going to be uh, relevant? And I don't want to take it out and immediately cut it. You're not cutting anything at this stage. You're just putting it aside for further examination. I was just going to say, this is your, okay, this is the consideration it's bin, right? Like, we're making a consideration. We're taking a closer look at all of these right, cards. Right, of yeah. underperforming cards. What else are we looking for when we're identifying these cards? You said maybe it's got a, a too high of a CMC, mm -hmm. so you get it. It just never ends up resolving. Mm -hmm. I like to also look at cards that maybe have a real low CMC and they don't do much. Right. Uh, you can see these, a good example of this for me is Child of Night. I see this in a lot of commander decks and it's it's nice. It's a two, one life link right. for two, but what's that doing for you? And uh, another one might be something like Thraben Investigator. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, you might have a deck where Thraben Investigator is really nice creating that clues are not nothing. Right. Clues are great. But I think that this is a card where maybe in a lot of decks isn't impactful. And so you maybe run it because on the more 60 card competitive scene, this is an incredibly good card. Right. Maybe it's not really doing it for your commander deck. And that's the thing is that it's not saying that these cards are bad. They may be like objectively good. Perhaps they're just not the best fits. Right. Or they're not the, to, you know, warn on, warn on the side of over optimizing everything. They're, they're not just like, the, the best version for what you're looking for. And part of that, you know, with like the Thraven Investigator, I was running, what was it? Uh, the Orzov one, the white black. White black? Oh, the, Orzov. Shut up. Um, but I had to make sure I have a two drop. Right. <laughs> I'm just not having a turn. But what was it doing? Maybe I would get the spirit out of it or I'd end up sacking. Oh, like, okay, that's fine. It's a perfectly playable card. Was it really the best use of that slot in that 99? Exactly. That's really the question. And so, like, you know, and Olivia has probably done her homework in designing that deck, and she is on curve, and she does want a two-drop, as she said there, but now we're going to say, is that really the best two-drop? Uh, another really good example is uh, cards where it is, again, a good card. I, I like to look at something like Chameleon Colossus. Mm -hmm. This is a, a four drop. It's too generic, double green. It's a changeling. Protection from black, that's not bad. Too generic and double green will also give it plus X, plus X till end of turn, where X is its power, starts out as a four, four. I think this is the type of card that it's very middle of the road. It's really what I'm going to grab when I'm looking for possible optimization and fine-tuning and mm -hmm. streamlining of my deck. Ask yourself the question at four mana, at two mana, yeah. at one mana, at seven mana, is there a better card that you can run in its place? Right. Whether it's a better card to connect with your commander, whether it's a better card to connect with other cards within your deck, whether it's just a better overall card. Right. Okay, so I've gone through my deck a couple times and I've pulled out maybe five, maybe 10, <laughs> maybe just two cards that I have identified as potentially needing fine tuning or upgrades or streamlining or whatever you want to call it. That's step one, ID your cards, identify what's weak, what's step two? Step two is going to be to actually now set the rest of your deck aside and evaluate what it is that you pulled for consideration. Um, I know something that I end up doing a lot when I'm building my decks is I find cards that are just objectively good mm -hmm. and throw them in. But if I have something, say, that is going to be dependent on devotion or is looking for enter the battlefield, like maybe the card is great. It wants a lot of ETB effects and there's maybe three cards with an ETB effect in the deck. Mm -hmm. While it's a great card, it's not really getting me the value that it could taking up that slot. So that would be something where, okay, if this is looking for ETBs, I really only have three or four. They're great ETVs, but it's, you know, 99 cards. Maybe I don't draw at this turn. Maybe there's a better use of a tutor, et cetera, et cetera. I should probably cut this. Right. <laughs> this is one that mm, it's not actually doing what I want it to, even though it's good. Right. Set that aside. Okay. This can get replaced. And do the same thing with the other ones. Look at them with a critical eye. 
of is this really getting what I need and making hap- and making that happen? You know, is this when it hits the board, is there going to be something else it can synergize with? Is there going to be some other way for it to bring me value? If not, that looks like something that you could maybe replace with something better. So evaluating, just looking over those cards, really thinking about your deck. Sometimes you, you know, look at the card you're considering and just paw back through the creatures that it's supposed right. to affect. Paw back through the enchantments it's supposed to interact with. Whatever it may be, make sure there's enough of them there to justify running it. Absolutely. If you've got a card like Sigarda's Aid mm-hmm. because you want to have a Voltron option on your commander, but then you look and you go, well, that's a very minor sub-theme. It's yeah. not a Voltron deck. I just happen to have a couple swords, a couple enchantments in there that I'd like to throw on my commander in a pinch. Mm-hmm. Well, do you really want to use a slot on Sigarda's Aid? Now, right. Sigarda's Aid is an amazing card. Fantastic card. But if there just isn't enough in the deck that it's going to be amazing with, right. that might be one that you want to swap out. And I really love that you mentioned look at things that are uh, some of the more must runs in colors or format staples Mm -hmm. in those colors. And even if you're like, well, I don't want to just run the same cards as everyone else, that's fine. But you can use that as a basis of comparison. Yeah. And you go and you say, okay, what are some of the just classic white cards, classic blue cards, classic red cards that are, that are, quote unquote, must runs. Yeah. You know, I, I do that series must run. It's not must run, but it's definitely, these are really good cards in those colors. I feel like they're must consider. Must like, consider. These are, these are the, That's, they're not must runs. Like have these the series that. Well, you didn't yeah. have me around when you did it. No. But that's that's exactly it. Like, right. If you're running white, look at Smothering Tithe. Right. If you if you just see all your four slots and be like, I don't know where I can put this one, you're crazy. But two. Right. <laughs> but two, it's, it's, I mean, it's going to get you mana. In a commander game, you're getting three out of it every cycle. If you're not... Okay. Right. If you're not <laughs> running Damnation in your black deck, you don't necessarily have to. But if you have pulled aside a four or five mana CMC card, mm-hmm. ask yourself, would I rather have Damnation in my hand than this card? Yeah. And if the answer is, yeah, that's going to be a lot more impactful. Even if Damnation isn't what you swap it for, that is maybe telling you that the card really is is in need of being swapped out. Right, right, exactly. And I, that like, like you said, the must runs, they aren't necessarily definitive that you have to run them in the deck. Right. These are, these are, these are staples, they're baselines where it's like, this is an extremely good value. It's something that benefits your color pretty much across the board. If you're not running it, this is, this is still the level of value you should be taking away mm-hmm. from whatever card is, is taking up that slot. Okay, so let's say you pulled out eight cards and you say five of those eight, Mm -hmm. I absolutely want to swap out. What am I swapping them out for if it's not the uh, uh, often run, you know, must run Mm -hmm. cards of that color? How do I know what to swap them out for? What are we looking at? What you want to look at in that case, if if there's not a, you know, staple that you automatically are just like, it totally passed your mind when you were building the deck and you're like, holy crap, I didn't put this in. I don't have Rhystic Study in here. (laughs) I said, I'm running blue. What's wrong with me? Right. So if it's not one of those, then the next thing is kind of consider what your deck does, right? Are you going to, uh, do you need to stay on curve? Is that like a really strong consideration? So you want to find something that's going to be an equal CMC so you can keep your slots even for that. If it's a different kind of archetype, if it's creature heavy, are you going to do creature for creature? Are you going to, are you going to do type for type, basically? Right. So you, this is going to be an artifact for an artifact, an enchantment for an enchantment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other things to consider for that are just the function of the card. Hey, is this a token generator? Is there a better one? Is there mm-hmm. a different one that maybe gives me tokens that are, you know, synergistic with the other creatures I'm running? There's, there's stuff like that that you want to look at once you've narrowed it down. Sometimes. It's tempting to see eight cards and just throw eight new cards in there. Well, did you take out a bunch of three and four drops and put in seven and eight? Mm-hmm. That's going to completely change how your deck works. Sure. I really Even love, if those are the effects you need. Absolutely. And I really love that point of CMC for CMC. Mm-hmm. You're not in this stage because you were having trouble on curve. The deck was functioning. Right, we're right. trying to add more gas, add more oomph. So, yeah, you, you look at that five mana CMC Planeswalker and say, is there a better five mana CMC Planeswalker or perhaps Enchantment or mm-hmm. uh, uh, Saga yeah. or, or something like that that is going to be a better card in its place? Uh, creature for a creature, removal for removal. Yeah. So for example, in preparation for this episode, we went through some of my older commander decks that I haven't upgraded in a while. 
And we identified phantasmal image in one of them as not being great. You didn't like that it can get targeted and then immediately just pop and be gone, which is fair. But you did also say that obviously this deck wants that copy ability Mm -hmm. in some form. So what did we swap it out for? We swapped it for Sakashima Student, which is a human ninja um, that has ninjutsu. And when it ETBs, you copy any creature on the battlefield except it's a ninja in addition to its other creature types. So it won't just disappear if it gets targeted by something. It gets to steal any other creature on the battlefield. And with the ninjutsu, you can get it in for what? I think it's one in a blue. Which is the same cost exactly as the phantasmal image. And then you get a creature that's got way more durability, can also pop in as a huge version of something else when it's unblocked, and you can there you go. You're off to the races. And the fact that it's using ninjutsu, which returns an unblocked attacker you control the hand, is if that attacker has an ETB effect, I get to then cast it again. There's so much more I can do with Sakashima's student. Don't let that four hard casting CMC fool you. You're spending the ninjutsu. It's the same as Phantasmal Image. And that is an example of a really good upgrade that we did in that deck. Or maybe you're going to identify a card like Blatant Thievery. And this is a good card, but. So Blatant Thievery is four generic and triple blue. So we're looking at high CMC and three blue in that high CMC. It's a sorcery, but for each opponent, gain control of target permanent that player controls. I mean, so you look at this card, and obviously we're not talking about it in the context of a specific commander, but what do you think of this? This is good, right? This is a good card for, I'm going to get three permanents in commander, but it's also very expensive. Am I going to get to pull it off? It's one that I would put aside, and I think that there's a lot of cards like this in various colors where it's like, that is a good card, but but maybe you're having trouble resolving it. Maybe when you get to the point, I've actually, and I'm using this as a specific example because I did used to run Blatant Thievery. And one thing that would happen to me a lot is I would play games where I would get to that point in the game where I can cast it and no one happens to have anything good for me to steal. There was just a board wipe or maybe one player has a steamroller card that's about to to get us all. Mm -hmm. And I could have just been control magicking it, but now I have to blatant thievery and I'm getting one good thing and a couple key runes. So this is when we put aside and you ask, is there a better thing you can be doing at five, six, seven? Is there a better thing you could be doing at seven in blue or around that? If you're going all the way to the wall with that CMC, maybe this is expropriate time. Yeah. Yeah. Would you swap it out for an even higher CMC to get more? Ex- Do you think expropriate does more than blatant thievery, even though it costs more? Would you rather have expropriate than blatant thievery? I would rather have the expropriate. I, think I would too. And that's the Unless sort of. The, my only consideration would be do I want to have blatant thievery in $40 over an expropriate? That is a very good consideration. <laughs> you that know, is a I very mean, like, good consideration. That's, so that's another thing, like when you are looking at this stuff, like sometimes the reason is because it's not financially feasible to have the perfect card for everything. Right. That's okay. Right. That is 100% okay. 100% okay. You do not and need to spend a rent payment on <laughs> getting a deck yeah. pretty, you know? Mm. So in that consideration, just be mindful of that. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I'll pay two more to get something I want from everybody or an extra turn, right. they get to choose, but I'm I'm benefiting no matter what. Right, right. And so, and again, we're just using that as an example. Yes. Like I'm not, it's, you're not always gonna do that. No, you don't Ooh. go and you say, all right, time to go buy those original duels or whatever. <sighs> First of all, the original duels, I'll argue to the end of days are not doing that much in Commander anyway. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, it isn't about just buying the more expensive card. But yeah. If price weren't an issue, looking at those two and being able to have that moment where your brain recognizes, I'd rather pay more and get more at this slot because if I'm already up to seven CMC, why not go a little further and get so much more? Yeah, I mean, getting the potential for multiple extra turns or taking a permanent is decidedly better, I would say, than having... Decidedly. Decidedly. But it really truly is. Yes. (laughs) But not in an awful way. No, not in... Well, I mean... uh, Mm. Depends on which side of that expropriate you're on, right? (laughs) (laughs) Right. And it's also a great segue to the next step in this process, which is work with a friend. Yes. 
enlist your friends. Right. <laughs> or even someone in your playgroup. If they're not super close with you, but they're a really good player and you like how their decks are built or their style, like, hey, if I if you were looking at my deck, show me five cards that you'd pull out or that right. you think don't work. Or, or could even, work better. It doesn't even have to be don't work. Show yeah. me the five w- least working cards. Right. They work, but they're not working <laughs> as well. Yeah. I mean, Phantasmal Image worked Absolutely. as my image effect. We're talking same CMC, yep. same kind of effect, yep. but eh, it could be more. Right. And so, uh, again, I really want to also stretch that we're not talking about malfunctioning decks or Correct. broken decks or anything like that. You're just asking your friend, find the five cards in my deck that make you go, wow. The least, yeah, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> if you were building this, where are you like? Oh, right, I'm not sure about this one. I would and always I, like. I get it, but uh, you could use this if you look at a card in my deck and say, you know what would be good. Pull that card aside. I want to see. I want to see what it is, and I want to hear why you think that. Absolutely, if the deck is working fine. Maybe I just beat you with it, but I still want your input. Like, what? Do you, what is it that you saw that I didn't? You right. know, right. And then actually. In that process, too, I uh, I was also looking at some of your decks, mm-hmm. and I pulled a couple cards out, and then you said, oh, wait, it does this, it, because it wasn't my deck, and I didn't know, right. oh, that's the point of it, and so we put those back right. in. I learned a little bit more about the game. I also learned a little bit more about evaluating cards. Mm-hmm. This is all an exercise. It's a process. You're not just born inherently being able to do this, and once you're able to do it, you don't just necessarily keep it. You have to keep practicing, mm-hmm. like... I can't just not play basketball once I get good at it. I have to keep practicing, right. even the pros have to do that. And in asking someone else to identify the shortcomings in a deck, uh, it is a process where we are better equipped sometimes to find errors or oversights in someone else's work and less likely to find it in our own. Absolutely. And so it really helps to have that outside perspective. And pet cards aside, because everybody has it. I, sure. I will run Ophiomancer in any deck with black. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if it fits. I'm running Ophiomancer. It's fine. <laughs> I've got a Shivan Dragon in my, you know, uh, Felden deck. I, I run it because it's my favorite card from high school. And, there's, and that's why I'm saying pet yeah. cards aside, like everybody's going to have something where you're like, why are you running this? Like, don't ask questions. I'm just, this yeah. is, I just run this card. It's, it's what I do. Don't worry about it. Right. With those aside, it's still really helpful because all of us have these very different play styles and we all have different access to cards or different histories with magic writ large. You can find out all kinds of things you've never heard of, you've never seen. I I mean, just us talking. I think when we, we were going through the sync deck, these cards. we discovered yeah. a ton of cards, but there was something, I, I think it was Saga Shima student, we were like, I don't remember this. I hadn't heard of it or something. Right. That or it just didn't come. It wasn't a, a recollection for you right off the bat. And I didn't even have to buy that card. I mean, yes, I have a very large collection, <laughs> but we then sat after identifying the dozen. Mm-hmm. It was a really fun process. And yeah. so again, you don't even necessarily need to spend any money buying brand new cards. Take your collection, sit down with your friend, and start pouring through the pages. Mm-hmm. And we did this, and you and I, you literally went, look at that, Sakashima student. That's what the phantasmal image gets swapped out for. Mm-hmm. And you had not, you were like, what is this from? Is this from Plane Chase? Yeah, you know, and, exactly. and it, uh, we went through that. It was a fun process. You learn cards. I love that about magic. It really is like, it's just there's too many cards to know them all. It's exactly. just too many cards to know them all. And you discover new things. And that's one of the great blessings of Commander is that you can use these old crazy cards you find or these cards that you've never heard of or that don't make sense anywhere else is that you get to bring them in or have somebody else with their knowledge and their play style inform you of them. There's so many cards I've learned about just from asking people on the internet, hey, I'm building this deck and I'll hear of, you know, 70 some odd cards I've never even heard of before. Right. No idea what this does. And I go look at it, but like, how was I missing this? <laughs> These are incredible. And it's all because somebody else is willing to say like, hey, this is what I use and here's why. And it's something I've never considered before. Yeah. Everybody wins from that. They get to share their knowledge. I get something more out of it. We both get to deepen our appreciation for the game. And I'm going to say something here. I have no idea. We didn't discuss this at all ahead of the episode, <laughs> so I have no idea your reaction to it. But I'm going to say this. Uh, if you do go through and you do, let's say you do say, oh, Sakashima student, uh, I really would like to swap it out for that. I don't have it. Mm-hmm. And I don't actually know what it's going for price-wise right now. Let's pretend it's going for a lot or more than you're willing to right. spend. Don't buy it. Proxy it. Just literally print it out on a piece of paper, cut that piece of paper Mm -hmm. out, stick it over a basic land in your deck, 
sit down with your friend and get a couple games and see if you like yeah. it. And if you do like it and you go, oh my God, I love this card. I'm in love <laughs> with this card. Then go see if you can trade for it. For see sure. if you can sell some cards for it. Yeah. Uh, what you want to do. But I really encourage people, especially in Commander, in playtesting, mm -hmm. to proxy the cards before you buy them. Nothing breaks my heart more. And nothing <laughs> has broken my heart more than when I've done this myself. <laughs> well, there is, it is when I hear from viewers and they say, I went out and I bought these cards and then they didn't do what I wanted. And I right. spent... $30, $60, $100 on all these upgrades. And now what? Proxy it first. Yeah. I don't know what you're, you're feeling on that, but I I'm, just say print it, proxy it. I'm 100% there for it because I did that with Tesa yeah. extensively. There are a lot, well, there are expensive cards in the deck. Some of them I didn't have or had no idea where they were. Right. So I just would take the back of a receipt, write this thing out on them and yeah. slide them in there and just be like, listen, guys, I just got to figure out if this works. Figure there's nothing, out if it works. Right, because there's nothing more frustrating than being like, fine, I made all these great upgrades to my deck, and you play them out, and still nothing happens the way you want it to. Yeah. Don't blow the money. Just like ahead of time, write it on the back of a piece of paper, goldfish it out for yourself, and see, hey, okay, does this actually work the way I want it to? People ask, how do I know if a card is good And I say, for Commander? And I say, nothing tells you more if a card is good than when you actually draw and then successfully cast and resolve that card, how you feel after that moment. <laughs> and that tells you everything you need to know. And so you have to play those practice games. Yeah. People don't want to do it. Sit down and do a 1v1 real quick. It's completely different, but just run it through with your friend if you've just got one friend over. I love to have like a little commander hangout party, get mm -hmm. another an extra friend over is even better. Go through each other's decks, do that, play it, proxy it, see if it's working. If it's someone that you really trust to and it's not, um, well, even if it's a super, super competitive group, um, when you're actually like in the game, sometimes, I know this sounds sacrilegious, but like play with your hand open too and oh, yeah. see if, <laughs> literally just lay everything out and go through with a friend. Okay, well, th there's this, this, this. Do they know that interaction better than you? Do they know that it doesn't work because right. you, they've tried it before? And it's like, actually, it doesn't do what you want it to do. Like our friend Belinda, who <laughs> right. everybody wants to work a certain way and doesn't. Um, those kind of things can be really helpful. And yes, you're showing them what your cards are. Big deal. It's fine. No one's going to memorize your deck and then just be like, well, if they've already cast these, yeah. many, it's not going to happen that way. Have someone help you out and mm -hmm. make sure it is what you want. There's two things I say. If you've never played a game of Commander where everybody had their hands revealed as a, uh, a, a skill building exercise, yeah. then you are missing out uh, on a really good skill building exercise. And number two is, is if you've never played Commander where everybody takes each other's decks and rotates one to the left. So uh, good. Boy, oh boy. First of all, both of these things are fun. It's just fun to do it at least once or twice. But second, as a skill building ex exercise, both of those are incredible. Uh, to play with someone's deck who is not your own, but it's not like a pre-con deck, fantastic. And to be able to see what are in people's hands and to comment on it. And, mm -hmm. and we're doing, it's almost like we're doing practice mode here. And you say, wait a minute, Olivia, why aren't you casting that? And, you, and then Olivia goes, why would I cast that? And I go, because you can ninjutsu it. And she goes, oh, right this, ooh, and then you might have played with your hand up and gone, eh, the card didn't do much for me right. because you, it was a new card. You don't mm -hmm. master it right away. I don't yeah. get you in a new video game and you sit down and immediately know all the moves. You <laughs> exactly. got to play it. You got to practice it. Right. And this is what people miss out on in Commander. And it's it's a big part of evaluating cards, of identifying cards, of assessing cards, of all of that, and just general skill building. And I would think that a lot of people derive more satisfaction from a win, not based on somebody else's mistakes or misunderstanding of something, but on actually like outplaying something, right? right. So. I don't want to, like, on our stream, we'll tell people miss triggers all the time or right. correct someone's action. Like, wait, 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 you, there's a better way to play this. And we'll walk it back. We'll talk through each other because it's more fun when it's based on this. Everybody's, like, you're not taking advantage of anyone's mistakes. Right. Or seeing something. I mean, I know I misplay all the time. But it's it's crucial to see that everybody has these blind spots. And especially in Commander, when there's three other boards you have to consider, it's super easy to overlook something that you think you know or that you think is very, would be obvious if you were an outsider looking in. Mm. And then when you're in the heat of something and trying to make decisions, you completely forget this effect here or this effect here or how these two things are going to interact. It's good to be able, like you said, to have an open hand and just practice everything out. So then it's almost muscle memory when you see certain cards come up. It's like, aha, I remember this always used to be a problem and it's not this time. 
because I sat down, we talked it through, right. and now I know why it works and how it works. Open hand, open mind. Sure. <laughs> You're really proud of yourself for that one, aren't you? Proud, yeah. <laughs> so the final thing we want to talk about isn't so much a step, but an aspect to this process. And it's actually a thing that I think you're becoming a bit of a champion of. I'm an absolute champion of yeah, this, yeah. And this is the idea of the commander sideboard. Mm -hmm. We talked about the commander sideboard as a way to control your deck's power level mm -hmm. to swap out really good cards for good cards and be able to bring that power level up or down depending on your playgroup's overall power level. Right. But where does the sideboard fit into this? So the sideboard fits in kind of at the evaluation and swapping stages that we were talking about. Sometimes you'll see things that, oh man, you have two cards that could fit in that spot really well. Right. Take them both along with you. Play one game with one of them, switch it out, play the other game with it. Especially if they're like really crucial pieces that you're in a tutor for, or, you know, or your closers, anything like that. Um, it's okay to have those with you for both the consideration of playtesting and figuring out which one is best in your deck that's kind of at its default. Like mm -hmm. when you just bring it out of the box, ready to play it, here's where it is. Or you can have it if you want to slightly alter the play style of your deck. There would easily be ways that you could say, ah, well, you know what? I do kind of want to go Voltron on this and I've got these five cards with me and I know exactly what I could slot out. Puts that cigar to Zade in this one, in this one drop instead of the three of an investigator. <laughs> you know, you can make those switches. And if you know exactly, if you know your deck well enough, and again, since we're talking about established decks that don't, right. that aren't running into these problems, you can then say, all right, well, without these pieces, but with these pieces, here's a different win con, here's a different flavor win, here's a different, you know, method of getting to my end game that you can then switch out. If you don't want to have a lot of commander decks, this can help you have variety. It can help you hone your decks in other ways because if they're going to be versatile and make sense with this one win con and you can switch a couple of cards out and they remain that, those are going to be really solid overall cards that you're working with. They're going to mean that your deck is cohesive. Even if you trade a couple things out, you still have an engine, you still have value, and it's not so linear, right? You're going to have Absolutely. a lot of different avenues to get to where you want to go, which is probably the W. So that's a way that you can keep some variety in things. You can challenge your mind with finding other avenues and not necessarily having to build an entire deck around them. You mm -hmm. can implement them as sub-themes or sub-win cons on an established deck. It, it, it will keep you sharp just in having variety. You can have just a couple decks, have a few pieces that can be switched interchangeably in them and keep your play styles fresh, keep the experience you're having with your play groups fresh and let you enjoy the game more because of it. And I also want to stress, none of this is permanent. No. You can put those cards back and I find that players can be very, very reluctant mm -hmm. to take out that card, even in step one. Yeah. Just step one, well, I don't want to put that in there because that means it's gone forever. Nothing's mm -hmm. gone forever. You put that card right back in. And I would actually encourage being very loose in terms of experimentation. Yeah. Play around, see if it works. You can always hit the undo button, put your deck exactly back as it was. But you might just make a really important breakthrough in trying this stuff out. Yeah, for Absolutely. sure. And, and you know, again, like you said, it doesn't have to be permanent. There's plenty of apps you can scan your deck in really quick, make those changes, be like, I hate everything about this, and just pull right. that back up, see what it is you slot it out, put it back together, be like, this never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But you, even then, you still gain something from it. You learned that these cards are not what you thought, that the, you know, your original direction was better, that there's other things to consider. Maybe your initial picks weren't exactly what you were looking for, but now you do know what you're looking for, you're still going to gain knowledge from right. it not being what you thought it was going right. to be. Exactly. That will make you a better player. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us of here course. today, Olivia. Uh, if people want to find more from you, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter if they haven't already. Which right. It's appearing below you fine. now. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's my last name at, uh, on Twitter and on Instagram too, I think. I don't and you have a really awesome streaming show that, unlike most streaming shows, is using paper magic Live and paper commander. EDA. Prof swung at me. You sat there doing nothing. This is not all my fault. Yes, it is. Three, uh, well, two. Mostly, but not entire. <laughs> what? Stop. Yes. Stop. Villain is 12. already dead. Yeah, that's all we do is we, um, there's a rotating cast and crew, except for me. I'm always there. Unfortunately, for some people, I'm sure. But <laughs> Jim from the Spike Feeders. We have is a Jim regular. from the Spike Feeders. Um, Loganish Seraph Six, who's like a 
mod and community administrator for a lot of people is on there. Um, one of my roommates and best friends, my husband will come on, Dave Kosen and John Humbert. And then who else do we had? We have Jeremy and Noel comes on. Jeremy Noel of Sheldon uh, of the right. Rules Committee. Occasionally, for once, I think we had this like teacher come on. Just once, and Just I will once. never be back on again. I mean, that makes never sense. been so mistreated in all my life. It's true. Jeremy Noel, villainous, villainous wealth for me for sixty four. Ban villainous wealth. Tell Sheldon <laughs> to ban villainous wealth. Uh, we can't just ban cards because you don't like them. Oh, okay. So that's not actually how the rules committee not how works. The rules committee oh, works. Well, you're not even on the rules committee. You're no, I'm pretty sure it's not the rules committee. Yes, works. right, right. MTG Mudsta was on one. Yeah, yeah. we've had Mudsta. Um, gosh, yeah. A lot of cool people. So yeah. uh, I'll provide links in this video's description. Uh, check out Olivia's stream, check out Olivia's content. And if you would like, to see more from me, you're already there. So why are you wondering how to do that? Just hit look. the subscribe button, hit notifications, defeat the Minotaur, you get the blue key, and then you might get updated about Just look video. for my face on the videos, those are the good ones. Anyway. Right, yes, yeah. <laughs> all the other guests. <laughs>